in this unit, we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about whether or not the market generates desirable allocations and whether or not government policies can help in inducing such allocations. It is actually useful to begin with a big picture of the problem. So the idea is the following. Think of what's happening in a market or in fact in any economy. You have a bunch of exogenous variables, which are who are the consumers for consumer identity, which are one that remember we have been labeled them as one to C, and each of them comes with a utility function and the amount of wealth that they have, that they bring to the market, that they start with. There are also a bunch of firms that I'm going to denote by firms identity, with their names being one up to F, and each of them arrives to the market to the problem with a cost function, C, J, that tells how many units of the M good it requires to produce different amounts of the output good. And notice that this cost function may include semi-fixed costs, fixed costs, whatever it is. But the key idea is that we know who are the firms, who are the consumers, and their exogenous parameters. All of this is fed into some sort of institution. And what I mean by institution is the set of rules and practices that is going to determine what is the actual allocation that is going to be what is the outcome of the economy. And there are many types of institutions. For example, right now, so far, we have been interested in pure markets. But you could imagine that later on in this unit, we're going to look at markets and government and government policies. You could imagine other more draconian policies like dictatorship, determine there is a single person who determines the outcome, etc. This is just what are the rules and practices that determine what is the allocation. And just to remember, remind you, the institution can only generate a feasible allocation. It cannot generate things that are not feasible. We we discover we discuss in detail in unit four what feasible allocations were. So. Here, I'm just reminding you to warm you up for this unit of some key notation. A feasible allocation was going to be described by the level of output for each firm. So the superscript that knows that these are firms, the, the um, subscript that knows who is the firm, so how much each firm produces, and then for the consumers, how much each consumer consumes of the two goods. We saw that in the first video of unit four. Here I'm just reminding you. And remember, the feasibility allocations just require these two constraints, that the sum over i or the amount consumed by the, of the, the sum of all, that the sum of good Q consumed by all consumers has to be equal to the sum of good Q produced by all firms. This is an F. And the second thing has to be that the sum of all good M consumed by consumers plus the sum of all good M used by firms by, to produce, which is this, has to be equal to the amount of the good that was available in the beginning. This is this part is just a reminder to, uh, to bring to the forefront of your uh, memory the notion of feasible allocation. Now here comes the big question. So big question that I want to investigate in this unit is, is the allocation, let me call this feasible allocation alpha, desirable. So what we want to do is we want to try to learn how to answer this question. If you have a market that generates a particular allocation, is that a good or a bad allocation? And if it's a bad one, what can government policy do? That's what we're going to start in this unit in a nutshell. One small remark before we move forward. Notice that I have phrased the problem as investigating whether the allocation alpha is desirable for any institution that may generate it. And the reason we want to study that in a little bit more general um, perspective than just pure markets is because we may want to be interested in looking at other institutions. For example, are the allocations generated by a market with a certain set of government policies uh, desirable or not. So we need to be able to determine whether the allocation is desirable in a more general context than only a pure market. There are three general classes of notions of desirability that are used in economics 
to judge whether an allocation is desirable. The first class are notions of efficiency. The second class are notions of distributive justice. And the third are notions of procedural procedural justice. Let me tell you a little bit about each one of them. Efficiency is just something that measures, it's a notion that measures a lack of waste in either production or consumption. And let me give you an example. If there are two technologies that can be used to produce whatever it gets produced and consumed, and one is more efficient than the other in the sense of requiring less cost to produce the same amount, then an efficient allocation requires that you use the more efficient technology. Distributive justice measures the extent to which the distribution of resources is fair. It just basically cares about fairness in distribution. And let me give you an example. One very famous notion of distributive justice is something called Maximin, which basically says that the social distributive justice at an allocation alpha, which we're going to denote by a measure W of alpha, is given by the minimum over all consumers I of the utility that they get at the allocation, at what the allocation gives them, basically. So you compute the utility at for every individual, you compute the minimal utility, and that will be the measure of distributive justice according to this maximum criteria. It's just measuring, if you, if you think about it intuitively, whether or not the, the, the amount of resources, and how, given how they map to utility, is distributed in an egalitarian way across people, in a, basically weighting the, well, the well-being of the worlds of person very heavily. Finally, there are notions of procedural justice which basically measure or focus on measuring the extent to which the process used to reach the allocation is fair, is just, is fair. Please notice a very important distinction between the first two and the last theory. The last measure of justice actually cares about the process, whereas the first two don't care at all. It only cares about the final allocation. In philosophical language, these are consequentialist notions, whereas this one is a procedural notion. Um, one example of this, of a potential notion of procedural justice, is um, equal treatment. Is everybody being treated the same by whatever process is, is, determined to de is used to determine the allocation? And the answer to the extent to which that is the case will be a measure of procedural justice according to an equal, tr equal treatment um, measure. Now, let me emphasize two things. First, uh, economists have studied, have used all of these notions to measure um, the desirability of allocations, but the ones that are used most commonly are one and two. Three is used a lot less commonly, it's a lot more complicated to study. So in this course, we're only gonna study notions one and two, and we're going to ignore three. If you're interested, take more courses in economics. The other um, thing that I want to emphasize is that both of them are important because these are orthogonal concepts, and you can have an institution-generated um, allocations, outcomes, that are good in one dimension without being good in the other, and vice versa. So we really need to look at both of them. And what we're going to do in this unit is first focus on efficiency and then look more carefully at distributive justice.